house of the Lord. Anybody glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. Thank you, worship team, this evening. What a joy it is to be able to be back on a Sunday evening and have the opportunity to worship and to learn and grow together. I do not take that for granted. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord. It's easier to preach to people than empty seats. I did that a few times. Don't like that. So, But today we're so grateful. Uh, that God's people is in the house of the Lord with us and those that's joining us by other means tonight. If you have your Bibles with you, Luke chapter number 10. Luke chapter number 10 is where we're going to begin. And we are going to just dive in. The Lord would help us for a few moments tonight. I want to continue. There's a lot of things going on in my spirit. There's a lot of things that I, I could teach on or preach on tonight, exhort on, but we're going to stay the course of continue tonight talking about godly leaders in an ungodly world. I want to talk to us tonight about the value of relationship, the value of relationships. Over the last few weeks, we have dealt with the call of God. We've dealt with the heart of a leader, the heart of God. We've talked about God-given vision and last Sunday evening we talked about priorities and decision-making of how important that is and how we need to be sensitive to those things. But tonight I want to talk to you about the vital role of relationships in leadership. How many knows that every one of us in here, it's not about position, not about a title, but there is people that is watching us. And there is people that, in many instances, is following us. Therefore, we have to realize that there is a leadership role in all of our lives. And we cannot disregard that. We must understand that it's important. We must understand that how we decide to conduct ourselves in that understanding does not just impact us, but it impacts everybody around us and even those we don't know. I'm going to give you a familiar story, maybe for many of you tonight, in Luke chapter number 10, beginning in verse number 30. I'm going to read it in your hearing. Jesus is speaking. And let's just lay a foundation together tonight. And we find that there's dialogue going on, and Jesus begins to speak in this manner, and he says, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came where he was, And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him and he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and he set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn, notice this, and took care of him. And on the next day when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendeth more, when I come, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. Tell your neighbor, say, go and do likewise. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for your word. Thank you for its anointing. Thank you for the privilege to teach for a few moments this evening. Lead us, guide us, and direct us over the next few moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. We find that clearly in scripture there is no one that really paints a picture better than Jesus himself when it comes to serving others. Can I tell you that if we are going to effectively 
touch a nation, a state, a community, a family, an individual, whatever scale you want to think on tonight, the only way that you're effectively going to do that is you are going to have to cultivate people skills if you are going to lead anyone anywhere. There is a, there's something that has been said throughout time amongst Christian leaders, and they would simply say something in a sarcastic manner, well, I love what I do if I just didn't have to deal with people. Can I tell you, those individuals are not worthy of the office that they hold because without people, there is no ministry. And the whole reason for ministry is for people. Now, we find in this passage of scripture that there's many things we can digest and we will in a few moments. But when you begin to look at the life of Christ, even though his life was short on this earth, in the earthly manner, I mean, 33 and a half years, and really we find him when he was eight days old in the temple. We find him when he was 12 years old in the temple. Then we don't hear anything for 19 years about what he did. And then on th at the age of 30, he comes back on the scene. So he really had three and a half years of public ministry or public exposure, if you will. Uh, because of this, there is something that's very fascinating to me because I know men that live a lifetime to try to create an environment for individuals to follow after them and to catch their vision. But we find that within a matter of three and a half years, and really at the very beginning of that time period of his life, immediately people wanted to follow him. And it wasn't because of his charisma. It wasn't because of his miracles, I don't believe. It wasn't because that he was taking a little boy's lunch and blessing it and giving it back to them and reaping a multitude of leftovers afterwards. People can argue and say, well, the, that's why they was falling was for the miracles and those types of things. I believe that's a very small margin of why people was actually wanting to be in the presence of Christ. The reason people wanted to be around him was because he was a perfect example of one that had cultivated people skills because there was nothing more important in his life than people. And he was a leader in that regard in such a manner that Everywhere he went, people followed him. May I ask the question today, we are serving God, we're, we're doing what we think we should be doing, but the question is, when you look over your shoulder, how many people's following you? So why is it that they followed him? Was well, simply because of this, it was obvious that people really was his passion. Can I tell you today, if you and I are going to be effective in ministry in any manner whatsoever, if we're going to be effective in touching our family, if we're going to be in effective in touching our community, our nation or the nations of the world, we're going to have to be individuals that have a passion for people. Notice he did not just meet one particular area of their life, but he met their physical spiritual and emotional needs. Now you and I are not able to do that in ourselves, but can I tell you, if somebody is starving in front of you when you tell them you're gonna pray for them, you are unbiblical. If you think, well, I have to get to my next event and I have to get to my next place where I'm gonna get an attaboy or I'm gonna get an applause and you can't take time to meet the need of the person in front of you, you're not a leader. And right now, there is people all around us that is hurting. They're starving physically and spiritually and emotionally. There is so much going on in our society today. And we look around and there's a lot of people that have titles and positions. But yet, I go back to what Paul said, and I've shared it every Sunday evening for the last five weeks, I believe. It's simply this. 
you have many teachers, but you have very few fathers. What he's saying, you have very few leaders. You have very few examples. Can I tell you today, we need men and women to understand the responsibility, especially for seasoned saints. We need to understand our responsibility is to help lead a generation. The basics of leadership is passion for people. An old proverb states this, he who thinks he leads but has no followers is only taking a walk. There's a lot of people that think that they're leaders, but yet they're just out for a walk. Can I tell you today, you and I need to understand that we are in a place where there has to be godly leadership in an ungodly world. If you can't relate with people, then they will not follow you. If I can't relate with you, I cannot effectively help lead and guide you to the place that God has ordained for you to be. Please hear me. If you want the true definition of success in your spiritual walk, it is simply found in these two words, developing people. So often I find myself amongst organizations and churches and people and there is no sound of an infant crying. There is no sound of the rustling and the the noise making of preteens and teenagers in the sanctuary. But then we ask, how is things? And they say, oh, it is well. It isn't well because the simple fact is that you're just sitting around to bury each other because it's going to be done when you're done. My success tonight is not based on how well I can preach or how well I can move a crowd. My success is not about how much material things I gain. It's, it's not about any of those things. It's not about name brand pair of shoes or an unnamed brand pair of shoes. It isn't about the latest and greatest of technology. But my success is, am I impacting a generation where, as Paul said, come follow me because I'm going to take you to Christ. We can never get away from the fact of what God has called us to. He has called us to be salt and he's called us to be light. Our lives should be causing people to become thirsty for the gospel. If we are effectively leading a generation, they are not going to become thirsty for us, but they're going to become thirsty for the God that's in us. If they are just thirsty to be with us and to hang out with us, we are failing. But while those things are important, notice with me, there's four truths about leadership and people. The first one is this, people are a church's most appreciable asset. The most important thing in this room right now is not a piece of equipment, it's not a a, a building, but it is the people that's sitting in it. If the building is filled with all of the latest and greatest, but there is no people, there is no value in the building. But because there's people in this building tonight, there is some precious things in this building. A leader also must understand this. A leader's most important asset is people skills. Yes, we are to develop our gifts. We are instructed to study to show ourselves approved. We are instructed that we are to play skillfully upon the string instrument. That means this, God deserves the very best that we can be and to offer him. It means don't just wing it because God deserves better. But beyond developing that, the thing that needs to be developed more so, especially in this era, is there needs to be the developing of people skills. 
Meaning this, there has to be an appreciation for the person sitting beside you, behind you, or in front of you and realize that God uniquely made them just like he uniquely made you. And yes, they are filled with flaw and error and there's personality differences, but yet, can you understand with me, that individual is so precious in the sight of God that he gave his son for them. And the same can be said for you. So if God loved them that much, how much more should we love them? Also, we understand this thirdly is a good leader can lead various groups of people because leadership is about people. You should not be boxed in but say, I can only lead people that look like me, sound like me, live like me. No, a godly leader, a man or a woman that is really after the things of God that's sensitive to the leading of God will understand that it is my responsibility to help to lead all people into the place that God has for them. But if we're not careful, our culture has taught us that all if they look a certain way, dress a certain way, have certain garb on it, well, they're, 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 no, listen, he died for everybody. And therefore, we should go after Everybody. And fourthly is this, you must understand you can have people skills and not be a good leader, but you cannot be a good leader without people skills. If you and I are going to effectively lead, we are going to have to learn how to take care of people. Now, if I bring us back to Luke chapter number 10 in our reading tonight, we see how we should serve people within this passage of scripture there's different groups of people in this story you know we notice this the first group that you see is the robbers the ones that stripped him of his raiment the ones that wounded him and here's what robbers do they use people they manipulate others and they see no value but they simply will take a victim and exploit it for their own selfish gain. They have no feelings, they have no concern. The other group that we see in this story is, we can identify as the priest. One is mentioned, he's a priest. The other is a Levite, which is in the lineage of the priest. So we can say that those first two individuals, we can label them in this category of priest. And this is what we can say about them. They was law keepers. They was religious. Some would even say maybe they was pure to a certain degree. But however, when they looked at this man, they saw him as a problem to avoid because they said, we don't really have time. Other things was more important. But then we find that the Samaritan, he had an understanding that the others did not. Notice with me, this story that is often called the Good Samaritan, it illustrates how we treat others based upon how we see others, or we see ourselves, I should say. And I want you to notice the difference between the first two groups that I mentioned in this group, the Samaritan. You have to understand in his culture, he was the lowest of low. He was despised, so he understood. He knew how it felt to be ignored. And because of that, when he saw this man, he saw the man as a person to be loved. Here's what I'll say to all of us in this room tonight. There will be a time in our lives, if it has not happened already to you, you will be tempted to do all three of these. You will be tempted to take advantage. You'll be tempted to avoid. And then you'll also be tempted to love people. You'll find yourself dealing with all of it, but the goal is to look past their faults and to see their needs every time. 
allow me to say this again, and I'm repeating myself on purpose tonight because I wanted to get into our spirit that leadership is relationships. Years ago, several Christian leaders got together in a summit. This is the reason for their summit. Their goal was to summarize the Christian faith into one sentence. As they began to go through the process in this summit, they challenged themselves and they actually took their goal a step further. And instead of creating a sentence, they created one word. And that one word was simply this, relationship. What separates us from all other religions in the world today is not that we preach better or we have more charisma or we have better entertainment, none of that. What separates us from other religions in the world today is this, it is the centrality of relationship. Everything that we do is built around it. Notice with me that when you look at the creeds or, dis, or the disciplines, if you will, notice when Jesus was asked about the greatest commandment, notice what he said. He said, we're to love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, talking about the vertical relationship that we have with our Father. But he proceeds a little further and he says also that we would to love our neighbor as ourself, meaning our horizontal relationships. Can I tell you today, if you and I are going to effectively change a world, we are going to have to first of all get this right in order to get this right. But if you don't value this, you will never fully step into this. So it means that you and I have to approach this thing in a manner that God teaches us. And notice he said that the way the world would know we are the disciples is how we handle our relationships. What will set us apart and will make us become the godly example that God wants us to be in our lives and in the community or in the, in, in our, in the culture in which we live will be because we understand the importance and the value of having relationships. Dr. John Maxwell makes this, say, this statement. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You can have the most intellect, you can have the most wisdom, you can have the most resources to meet every need that they have, but they do not care what you know until they know how much you care. A definition for spiritual leadership, if you're taking notes tonight, that I want to give you is the following. One who assumes responsibility for the health and the development of his relationships. How many knows that it is not the other person's responsibility? It's your responsibility to ensure that the relationships that you value and the relationships that you will make in the future as minimum of faith, it's our responsibility to take the leading role in that, especially if it's with people that are unsaved. Somebody does not have to become a Christian in order for you to have a relationship with them. But it very well may be your relationship that takes them to the place where they experience faith. And it may not be in six months, it may not be in a year, but it may be five years, six years, or ten years. But if you have a relationship with them, there will come a time when they will lean on you because of the faith that you have. If I could use word pictures tonight just to help paint this for us this evening... I'd like to use the analogy of a host. Notice with me, probably all of you have hosted a cookout or a gathering at your house or you've been in charge of entertaining friends or family. A good host takes the initiative and makes others feel comfortable. Can I tell you today as a leader, as an individual, as a man or a woman of faith, it is your responsibility to host the relationships that God entrusts in your care. 
You know why God connected you with the man or the woman at the supermarket that everybody else walked by is because God is entrusting you to host a relationship with them. You ever wondered why, well, why is somebody, why is the, why are, why have they been brought into my life? It's because God is desiring to use you so that they can see him through you and in you. But in order for that to happen, please hear me tonight, we're going to have to learn that as a leader, you must host the relationship and the conversations of your life. Leaders are not guests in relationship. You have to make people feel comfortable. When somebody walks into the local church, they should never feel uncomfortable. We just talked about this in our meeting last week. Everybody, especially if it's the first time that they come into the house of the Lord, they should be greeted multiple times. Greeting people and smothering people is two different things. We never want to smother anybody, but we always want to let people know that, hey, we'll host this relationship. We will make you feel comfortable. We will make you feel valuable. We will make you feel wanted. Here's the question I'm going to ask you today, and this hasn't been mean-spirited at all, but we had a house full of visitors this morning. How many of those visitors did you get up and walk across the aisle and greet them and host a relationship? Yeah, yeah. Oh, but that's not my strong suit. Listen, it's not about that. It's about the simple fact of understanding that if you have Christ in you, and you have the spirit of God in you, and you say you have a desire to make the world a better place, it starts by touching people. And there's no easier place to touch people than in the house of the Lord, especially when they show up at your house. And if you can't do it here, you'll never do it out there. But every individual that walks into your realm, you have to make a conscious decision. You know what? I don't know why they're here, but I know that while they're here, I'm going to host them. They may just be here for a short season. Uh, They may be ones that move in. I don't know. But if they're just visiting... As they're passing through on vacation, they're going to know this, uh, that when they was at our house, they was hosted and they was felt uh, comfortable and they felt like they was part of the family. Hear me. Godly leaders make people feel important. Many leaders make the mistake of separating leadership from relationships. Can I tell you, if you're going to be effective in the kingdom of God, you're going to have to learn how to communicate with people. The second word picture that I'll give you tonight is this. It is the analogy of the doctor. You know what separates doctors? You know what separates good doctors from bad doctors? Good doctors ask questions. You say, what do you mean by that? A good doctor will probe through the weeds until they find what the need really is. As you attempt to discern people's needs, ask questions. Not being nosy, get to know who they are. Not trying to get their mail, not trying to get their falls. No, I'm talking about you begin to find out who they are. What makes them tick? What, is, what do they like? What don't they like? What language do they speak? It is only when you do and try to address that Notice with me, we're so quick to try to give people a prescription before we have a real genuine diagnosis. This happens every day in the natural realm. You can go into the doctor's office, and I'm not throwing off on medicine at all because it has a place. But many times because of the work, and you can talk to doctors and people in the medical field right now, they will tell you if they're open and honest with you, we are so distraught that we can't give our patients the care that they need because right now they, they're, they're more, nothing more than data entry people 90% of the time because they have to do that before they can see their people. And there's a great level of frustration in that field. But what you'll find out is this. They say, well, I've not really seen that before, or I don't really know, and they don't have the time to go research it. So there they say, they will use a general prescription, hoping they can get it. One of the things that they often use is this. One of the things that has been probably prescribed to many of you in this room would be penicillin, or it would be 
a few other things we could mention because it is one that takes care of just general things that they know has been tried and true and has been used multiple times. So therefore, we got to try to treat you. We got to try to psychologically make you feel better. We got to make sure that we're going to do something for you because you did come and see us, but they did not have the ability, nor did they take the time, nor could they because everything else was going on and therefore they're just prescribing. Let me ask this question. How many times have we tried just to prescribe to people something that we, well, that worked for me 15 years ago. Here, let me just give that to you. Without really hearing and diagnosing what the issue is. Can I tell you a Band-Aid will work for a paper cut, but a Band-Aid will not work when a sword has been drawn. Stay with me tonight. The analogy of a counselor Please hear me, good counselors. What separates them from just an average counselor is this. A good counselor is an active listener and is very gifted at interpreting what they hear. As a leader with solid people skills, no no tonight. People don't really expect you to have every answer. People want you to have a good ear so you can hear. And they don't need you to take them all the way around the mountain. They just need you to give them the nuts and the boats of it. Please hear me. You and I only earn the right to speak by listening. If you and I are going to be godly leaders and we are going to take people into a place and we're going to take them into a place where they have a relationship with God and that we build a real lasting relationship as well, we have to understand this. And fourthly tonight is this, the analogy of a tour guide. Anybody ever been on a trip in a foreign land and you wanted to go see something but you didn't know how to get there from where you was at? So what do you do? You get a guide. Why do you get a guide? It's because, can I tell you, there's something that a guide does. Guides don't merely fellowship with you even though they talk to you throughout the day and throughout your trip and they have small talk with you and they do that because they want a good tip. If you don't know that, I'll give you a heads up. That's why they do it. But they'll, they'll talk your leg off and they'll act like you're your best friend. But you know what? You know why you have a guide? It's not because they just want mere fellowship and not because you just want mere fellowship with them. But a guide, they know how to get you to a specific destination. Right now, many people come to the house of God searching because they're broken. They're in a state of disarray and they know what they want. They want peace. They want, they, they want tranquility. They want healing. They want deliverance. They don't want to feel like they're feeling. They, they want something different than what they currently have, but they just don't know how to get there. And here's one of the greatest travesties of our day. And it goes back to what Paul said. He said, when you should be teachers, you still are in need of a teacher. You should be eating meat, but now you're still on the milk. And therefore, what he was simply saying, we can say it in this manner. When you should be a tour guide and taking people to the destination of Calvary, you don't even know how to get there yourself. But you've heard the preacher preach, you've heard the singer sing, you've heard the evangelist come, and it just kind of comes in and we get the emotional side of it, but we never apply it to ourselves. Can I tell you, you can have somebody teach you and show you, but if you never use it, you will always lose it. There is things that I have been taught through the years. I've sat through many seminars. I went through so many training classes. There's been so many tests that I've taken throughout my adult life. And it was like it was beneficial while I was doing that in my life. But if you set me down and had to do some of it, some of it I've lost because I've not used it for 15 years, 20 years. Even though I might retain part of it, I don't retain all of it. You can go set me in front of a 1500 I ate a a transfer press and I guarantee I can turn it on, but I'm going to have to scratch my head and I'm going to have to go back to the book and I'm going to have to look how to make some of those things operate. Like even though I used to do it every day, all day long, but can I tell you, there's some things that you lose if you don't use it. 
and we sit in the house of God Sunday after Sunday, week after week, year after year, and we're taught about the great commandment. We're taught about the great commission, uh, and, we, and we get excited about it when revival comes and when camp meeting comes, and, and, and we'll, we'll go do a, a community event and say, oh, that was amazing, or we'll go on a disaster run, and we'll say, oh, that was effective, and, you'll, and you say, oh, that was so wonderful. I prayed with somebody, uh, and man, and you did it, you was together, but then you don't do it for a year. You don't do it for two years, and then you say, oh, I'm just so scared. I don't know. I don't know. Listen, somebody's got to be a guide. If you and I are going to be godly leaders in an ungodly world, please hear me. We got to do more than just show up. We have to apply ourselves. I'm hurrying because some of you are bored tonight, but I don't want you to be bored. I want you to be changed by the word because can I tell you, there's a world that's hurting and dying all around us as we shed this morning. There's a few things that every leader should know about people. And this is not talking negative about people, but this is the reality about people. And and I want you to understand there's a few things that you should know about the people sitting around you today. There's something you should know about the people that's in your family, the people that's on the job, people that you're going to encounter this week. They may have a smile on. They may have it all together on their outward appearance, but can I tell you, the people that you're going to meet this week on a general statement and a general, many people, many people are insecure, so therefore it is your responsibility to give them confidence. As godly men and women today, notice the key principle is this. You have heard me say this often. Hurting people hurt people. Secure people offer security to people. How much security are you offering to others today? Notice, somebody needs to tell somebody you can make it. Because about 500 times a day, the enemies tell them you're not going to make it. But secure people offer security to people. Most people are insecure in some area of their life. And most insecure people are looking for security in some manner. A secure environment is provided only by secure and confident people. If you ever had a little baby, a little toddler get jarred and shaken, and they get real antsy and anxious, and they come running to you. And the first thing they do is what? They run to you and they put their arms up because they want you to take them. And when you put them in your arms and you put them in a secure environment, they was agitated, they was uh, uncertain, and then all of a sudden you can feel their tension leave their body and they become comfortable. Little Jax was with us the other night, spent the night and at like five o'clock in the morning there was thunder and lightning. We hadn't had a thunderstorm and I don't know how long. And all of a sudden the lightning comes fl- flashing through the bedroom and, it, and he says, Paul, what's that? Paul, what's that? And he was uptight and he was restless. We got up, we went to the couch and I showed him. We looked out the back door and we was watching the lightning. We was, we was hearing the thunder and, and he didn't know what it was. But after holding him, assuring him that it's okay, you could sense the calm and he went back to sleep. Why am I saying that? A secure environment is provided only by secure and confident people. I was confident that he was going to be okay. I was securing him in my arms and therefore I knew that the thunder wasn't going to get him. And because he was in that environment, He was affected by a secure environment. Please hear me. What every leader should know about people also is this. People like to feel special. And therefore, if you're going to effectively touch people's life, you must find ways to honor them. We should never tear people down. We should always find a way to honor them. A key principle that I want to give you tonight is this. To deal with yourself, use your head. But to deal with others, use your heart. Be as hard on yourself as you want to. But be filled with compassion as you work with others. 
because if it wasn't for the grace of God, it could be you. Please hear me. The only reason I'm standing here tonight, not in a bar or in a grave, is because of the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, and the compassion of God towards my life. It's not because I lived in such a manner that I deserved it or that I earned it, but only because God's grace and mercy and because there was individuals that saw good in me when I didn't see good in myself. Hear me. I've never been one to want attaboys. I've never been one to want to be in the center of the room. I could sit in the back of the room. That's fine with me. But in some of those darkest hours of my adult life, there was individuals, a handful of individuals that made me feel special. And I said, they didn't give up on me. Hear me. The other thing that you and I should understand as we lead others is this. People look for a better tomorrow. Give them hope. I didn't say give them false hope, but I said give them hope. I didn't say paint a picture with rose-colored glasses, but give them a picture of hope. With God, all things are possible. He makes things new every morning. There is a way for you and I to give people hope. Notice with me, the key principle for this statement is this. The key to today is a belief in tomorrow. I'm going to make it through today because I believe this. God's already in my tomorrow. And it's going to be better tomorrow. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're fighting through today, but I'm going to tell you something. If God wakes you up in the morning, you have the opportunity to make tomorrow better than today. But you've got to make people understand that. Because the enemy is telling them this is the last day. This is the last opportunity. Oh, this you messed up and you did this and this is wrong and that's upside down. But there needs to be a godly leader in an ungodly world and say, I don't care how big the mess is right now, that there is a better tomorrow if you trust God. But we're a silent community. While the enemy continues to speak continually, in the ears of people. Can I tell you, I pray that we understand this and I'm doing this Sunday night for a reason because can I tell you, it's not just a pastor's responsibility but it is the people of God's responsibility to tell the culture around them that there is hope in a man named Jesus. Also, if you and I are going to be godly leaders in an ungodly world, we must know this, people need to be understood and therefore, you must listen to them. There's a few regrets that I have in my life. There's a few regrets in ministry that I have. And I tell you, one of the biggest regrets that I have has been too busy on a few occasions to not really hear what I need to hear. Please hear me. I heard, but I didn't really hear. There's people that have sat in my office and talked to me. There's people that I've hugged their necks and I've told them they're going to make it. And I've told them I'd be there for them, and I was to the best of my ability, but there's a few times that I was just too busy for something that wasn't even eternal. And you hear me. I heard, but I didn't listen. Because they gave me their heart, and I probably could have done more. And some of them are no longer here I can't change that I have to live with that a godly leader in an ungodly world will 
take time to understand who's in front of him. We can fill the house up, but if we don't understand them, there's no use for them being here. The key principle tonight that we need to understand is this concerning this statement is to connect with others, understand the keys to their heart. You got to hear what they're saying, not verbally, but what's their heart saying? What's their heart saying? We need some godly leaders. The next thing I want to give you tonight, if you're going to deal with people and you're going to be a godly leader in an ungodly world, you must understand this, people lack direction. We need to take the responsibility of navigating for them. There's some people in this room, I'm going to be honest with you, you can drive, you drive a car just as good as anybody else, but you don't have any navigation skills whatsoever. You get lost everywhere you go. I'm not pointing you out, but you know who you are. Why are y'all laughing and looking at each other for? And in your own mind tonight, you say this, I can drive better than my spouse. I can drive better than anybody in my family. I can drive. But can I tell you, it does you no good if you're going to drive if you don't know how to get where you need to go. There's a lot of people know how to drive the car, but they don't know how to navigate to where they need to be. As a leader, it's our responsibility not to drive the car for them, but it is our responsibility to navigate for them. Notice with me, most people can steer the ship, but they can't navigate or chart the course. There's a lot of people that says, I won't get to Jesus, but they just don't know how to get there from where they're at. But can I tell you, you've done navigated that path. You know how to get there. But how many people have you shared or how many times have you charted the course for the people around you today? You see their hurt, you see their pain, and you hear their hearts cry, but have you navigated the course for them? If you're going to be a leader, notice this, you have to know the way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not only do leaders must know the way, but this is where it gets a little close to home tonight. It's not enough just to know, but leaders must go the way. You could say it like this, say, you, if you're going to talk the talk, you're going to have to walk the walk. See, leaders must know the way, leaders must go the way, but also leaders must show the way. They don't necessarily need you to tell them verbally, they just need to see you live it out before them. It's kind of like the young boy was in the back of the car. His daddy had just got done preaching. They're driving home and it was kind of quiet. And the little boy looks up and says, Daddy. He said, yes, son. He says, that story you told when you was preaching tonight, was that a real story or was you just preaching? It's not enough to tell a story, but it's about living in a manner where you know that you know that what has been said is, is accurate and it's real. Can I tell you, it's not about just telling people what they should do or how they should do, but we should walk it out before them. Some of you may have saw this. It went viral here a while back, just uh, six months ago or so or what have you. There was this guy, and he was pulling a prank on his little three- or four-year-old daughter, and he says, sweetie, i got to do an interview. Uh, i got to do a video interview for these people, and I want you to sit beside me because it'll make me look really good. And she says, okay, Daddy. So he turns on the computer. He sits there. He's got his tie on. He's got his jacket on, and he begins to speak, and he says things like this. Every day I get up, and I run 12 miles. I get up, and I come back home. And I have breakfast for my children and for my wife. I start the laundry before they're ever even out of bed. And this little girl's eyes keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally, she can't take it anymore. And she says, Daddy, you're lying. And he says, no, sit down, sweetie. It, I, 
you don't know. And then he keeps going and he keeps laying on. And she's like, Daddy, you're lying. You're, you're not, you don't do that. And he's like, I only eat vegetables. And, and she's like, and this is, it's one of the most funniest things, but it's one of the most practical things is if we're not careful, we try to get people to believe certain things, but yet we refuse to apply ourselves to the same type of principles. Can I tell you today, the value of relationships is understanding that it is our responsibility to navigate for others, yes, to help them along the way, but we also must show them the way, and we show them by living a life that is an example, and we are to be like Christ, not like the world. I'm hurrying tonight. People are needy. I don't say that in a derogatory way, but I say that in all reality, people are needy. And if we're going to be godly leaders, we have to speak to their needs first. I alluded to this a few moments ago. It does us no good to tell them, hey, Jesus can fix your problems if they're starving, if they're hurting, and we have the means to meet their need, but yet we choose not to. Please hear me. Most people think like this their situation is unique their problems are the biggest their faults should be overlooked their time is most precious that's how most people think their problem has got to be at the top everything has got to be about this, 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 and this. But leaders, however, have to have a different perspective. A true leader will put their people first, not themselves. A true man or woman of God will know the needs of their people. They will not just see the fault, but they will see the total picture. They will see the good and the bad but they will love people to help grow people. They don't love people to get from people, but they love people to grow people. Philippians 2 and 4 says, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. That's what Christ did. Lastly, this evening is this. People get emotionally low. I wish we all was able to live on the mountain, but it don't happen. You're going to go through some desert seasons. You're going to go through some valleys. You're going to go through some uncertainties. But here's the thing. It's our responsibility as men and women of faith to encourage them. The word of the Lord simply teaches us that we are to encourage one another. In Galatians 3, verse 12 and 13. I want to make this statement today. What gets rewarded gets done. What's focused on gets done. Years ago, an experiment was conducted to measure people's capacity to endure pain. How long could a barefooted person stand in a bucket of ice water? I tried that today. It wasn't too awful bad. You get numb pretty quick. It was discovered that when there was someone else present offering encouragement and support, the person standing in the ice water could tolerate the pain twice as long as when there was no one present. Think about it. And it wasn't because the other person was in the water with them, but it was because there was somebody there temply telling him this, you can do it, you can make it. Amen. Do you realize the power that you have as a man of faith and a woman of faith? The song simply says this, I just held on. Can I tell you, if they'll just hold on. He's never late. But 
what gets people in trouble is they don't have oftentimes somebody to encourage them and they let go. Please hear me tonight. As they come to the music this evening, I can say this after dealing with people for many years. I've never met somebody that did not want to succeed. I've dealt with a lot of people that didn't feel like they deserved to succeed. But I've never met an individual that didn't want to succeed. So here's what we need to do. If we're going to be godly leaders in an ungodly world, we got to make a commitment to help them win. My purpose tonight is not to condemn anybody that I come in contact with. My purpose is not to cast judgment on anybody, but my purpose tonight is to help you win. My purpose tonight is for you to be better tomorrow than you was today and for you to be better the day after tomorrow than you are tomorrow. Here's what I want us to understand today that we have the ability through the power and the anointing of God in our lives to reach out and help others achieve their goals. Don't miss this statement tonight that I got from John Maxwell. It says, victory has a thousand fathers, but defeat is an orphan. Victory has a thousand fathers, but defeat is an orphan. Not every individual that you're going to come in contact with is blessed. with a family structure that propels them to believe in themselves. And unfortunately in our society, there is a large majority of individuals that are living a life where they feel like they're just orphans. Like nobody cares Nobody understands and nobody's investing in me. Nobody even sees me. I am Mr. or I'm Mrs. Invisible. And that's how they live their life. And here's the greatest travesty for me concerning that specific situation is that many of those individuals sit in a church house every Sunday morning They see the Spirit of God moving on this one and moving on that one, and yet they sit. They hear some of the greatest preachers in the land preach some of the most powerful messages, but yet they sit. They walk to their car, they sit down in their seat, and the moment they sit down, the enemy is already in there simply telling them things like this, you might as well just quit. Nobody even saw you. Nobody even cared for you. Nobody even knew you was there today. Why don't you just go ahead and take that bottle of pills? Why don't you just go ahead and take that little ride that you've talked about doing? You know it would be better. Nobody would even miss you. It's an orphan spirit. But victory has many fathers. You have no idea what the impact may be when you walk into the house of the Lord and say, Garrett, I love you, man. Good to see you this morning. Hope everything's well. Brother Dan, great to see you this morning. Appreciate you, buddy. 
You have no ideal because what you're doing, you're taking the role of spiritual leadership and you're confirming and you're you're driving back the lies of the enemy with those little statements and you start walking by these children, these boys and girls and you start saying, you're a mighty man of God. And laying in the bed last night, the enemy said, oh, you can never do what you're dreaming about doing. Victory has many fathers. The children in this house The young adults in this house will celebrate victory after victory only if they surrender to the Lord, yes, but at the same time only if there is a group of elder men and women around them that is continually affirming them and telling them that you are who God says you are. So you're giving birth to things in the spirit realm that you don't. That's why I come back to this. The value of relationships cannot be overstated tonight. One of the greatest things that's missing in the American culture today, in the American landscape today, is this. It is community. And the reason that there is not a sense of community is because we have lost the desire to have relationship with people. There's a few in this room tonight that can understand and remember the days of dinner on the ground all day homecoming services, camp meetings. I'm not saying it was all perfect, but I'm saying this, there was a sense of community there. You felt like you belonged. You felt like you was loved. And the reason for it was because people understood the value of relationship. There's some things we have to get back to today as men and women of faith. I could sum up everything that I've said tonight in this statement. People seek models to follow. It's your responsibility, my responsibility to become the example that they follow. Here's what you and I need to understand. People do what people see. That's why today while we was, had a few people together, that's why my little buddy went in and wanted a microphone and began to stand and preach. Because he does what he sees. Why is it that a two-year-old wants a rag and a a spray bottle of wax to clean his Jeep? Because that's what he sees. Why is it that when the ladies decided to wash dishes that he said, I got to go clean the kitchen? Because he does what he sees. Are you with me tonight? You say, well, we need a generation that prays. I agree. If they're not praying, it's because they're not seeing somebody pray because they do what they see. We need a generation to worship God. Yes, we do, but why aren't they worshiping God? It's because people do what they see. Oh, what I would give. I've said this before, but oh, what I could, oh, what I would give to be able to walk into my house on, on Galaxy Drive to open the door and to hear my mama sing again. Oh, what I would give to hear my daddy's voice come up out of the register vent, out of that old basement again. Why is it when I was a kid, I would grab a guitar and go down and sit in the basement and sit on a stool and act like I was Scott Smith and Gloria and the others would shout like different individuals in the church 
is because we did what we saw. They would say, guess who this is? And they'd shake their head and they would dance and we'd say, oh, we know who that is. Because that's all we knew because that's what we saw. How many people's worshiping like you? How many people shouting like you? How many people's testifying like you? Oh, well, this generation don't have a testimony anymore because people do what people see. If you don't like what you're seeing, you're gonna have to change the example that you are. I'm not even gonna apologize for being long-winded tonight. The early followers of St. Francis wanted to know what to do when they went out into the streets to minister. This is what he said. He said, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. Folks, we just gotta live this thing. But here's how we have to live it. We have to live it out loud. Yes, steal away and pray, but take those babies in there and pray too. Yes, have your own time with God, but at the same time, take your family into the presence of God with you. You want there to be revival in this house? Then let revival begin at your house by being a godly example. Can I say this to the men in this room? You do not have to become somebody that is a feminist in order to worship God, but in your masculinity, in the, in your masculinity you can still lead your family into the presence of God. The greatest relationships that I have today is my family and my church family and then beyond. But if I fail, God forgive me for failing, but if I fail, life is busy, life is hard, life is demanding for all of us, but can I tell you, it doesn't matter that my son just turned 29 a couple of days ago, he's still my son. Does it matter that my baby girl will be 27 in a few weeks? She's still my baby girl. Those still have to be our priorities. We still have to live it out before them. God, help us today to value relationship. I got to quit tonight. We can't be okay continually going to the funeral parlor and lay a generation in the ground. because we refuse to be leaders. You and I are enjoying the comfort of sitting in this room tonight because at certain times in history the call of leadership. It cost the generations that came before us everything. They laid their life down so you and I could have the freedom that we have today. And while we're sitting in one of the most free places, if not the freest place on the planet tonight, we are allowing an enemy to imprison a generation on our watch because Please don't be offended by what I'm getting ready to say. 
but if we could see the garments that we have on tonight from the eyes that God has, what we're calling success, garments of success is nothing more than garments of pride and garments of selfishness. Garments of self-righteousness. Because we have no idea how important relationships are today. But when the next one when the next one's stolen from us we'll go to the funeral parlor and we'll weep and we'll cry and say oh it's a travesty. But where is the godly leaders in an ungodly world that says not today devil and not tomorrow. As long as there's breath I will stand and I will fight until I can't fight anymore. They're worth fighting for. They're worth fighting for. They're worth fighting for. Take your finger and go right there. You're worth fighting for. So please forgive me tonight. But somebody's got to lay between the porch and the altar again. Somebody's got to climb the stairs to the wall and become the watchman over the souls of this generation. Somebody. Somebody. God, let somebody have a burden for the lost. somebody have a burden to build relationships let somebody say nothing else matters as we stand all over the house this evening to read in John chapter number 13 short, shortly before Jesus goes to Calvary he gets a basin of water gets a towel kneels down at his disciples feet begins to wash them He asked the question, he says, know you what I've done to you? And he says, do you understand the gravity of what just took place in your presence? Verse number 15 of chapter number 13, 
This is what he said. He said, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. You know what it means to be a godly leader in an ungodly world? It means to pick up a basin of water and grab a towel and put on a garment of servanthood. There's a generation that we must serve tonight. If we will serve them as Christ served his people, we will experience a generation, experience the revival fire that will bring life, that will bring peace, that will bring rest, and that will bring joy. Dear Heavenly Father, tonight, as we stand in your presence, oh, in the stillness of your presence, Lord, I pray that you would speak to the hearts of your people tonight. Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to respond. For Lord, tonight we know this, that you have entrusted into our care this time and this season in history. And it's not your desire to lose one, nor is it ours. Today, Lord, help us. Help us to be the leaders that you're calling us to be. Lord, as we minister this morning, help us to be the relentless church that you're calling us to be. Lord, I pray for every man, every woman, every boy, every girl under the sound of our voice tonight. Lord, I pray tonight that there would be an awakening in such a manner that we would understand our role and how important it is to build and to value relationships. Lord, I pray that there would just be a freshness of your spirit rest upon your people, that the vertical relationship would become stronger and clearer than it ever been. For Lord, we know that that is what helps us with the horizontal relationships of our life. Let us be willing to love people right where they are. Help us, Lord, to be your hands and your feet. Help us, Lord, to behave and conduct ourselves as the Good Samaritan did where he took time and he responded and he loved. Help us, Lord, to love in this moment of time. Lead us, guide us, and direct us is our prayer. Lord, I pray that this would be a week of opportunity for your people that would not be missed opportunities, but it would be opportunities that they would take in where they could love on people and lead others to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let there not be a spirit of fear upon them. Let there not be a, a willingness to be silent, but Lord, let there be a willingness and a boldness to speak with love and compassion. Lord, help us to be good listeners. Help us to hear, not just words, but help us to hear the heart of those that you brought in front of us this week. Lord, we're believing and trusting for complete restoration in the lives of men and women today. Lord, I thank you that you are faithful, that you are good, 
So today, Lord, I pray that you would bless your people as they go in and out. Pray that you would bless them in the city and bless them in the field. Lord, I pray that your face would shine brightly upon them this week and give them blessed peace. Lord, I pray for their extended family. Let there be nothing evil come nigh their dwelling. But Lord, I pray for health and strength and protection. I pray for love and joy to abound. I pray for the song to be restored the shout of victory to return. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor. And the people of God simply say. Hey everybody, it's Pastor Jade Abrams here. I just want to thank you for watching and joining with us today. We're so glad that you chose to be with us. We just encourage you to stay in contact with us. Click, follow, subscribe on all of our social media platforms to stay up to date what's happening here at PTC. We bless you in Jesus' name and we love you and so does God. Have a good day.